My guest today is political philosopher and sociologist Daniel Gerbs. Daniel is the leader of the, of the Nordic School of Metamodernism and the co-author of the Hansi Freinacht books, The Listening Society and the Nordic Ideology. He currently lives in Sweden. In this conversation, we talk about his upcoming book, 12 Much Better Rules for Life, which is still uh, its working title. Uh, and we, we delve into the structure and, let's say, generator function of how these rules towards metamodernism came about. It was a long talk, and with topics like this, it takes some time to get proper into flow. And I hope uh, you will enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Okay, Daniel, thank you very much for coming to the Parallax podcast. You have a new book coming out with a working title, 12 uh, Better Rules for Life. Is that correct? Um, well, yeah, that's the working title. One. Yes. And de depending on legal issues and other things, we'll look into uh, more closely. Um, the, the title might change, uh, but, but the idea is uh, to somehow present uh, um, uh, the, the, through a framework similar to, to uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, um, present, present some sort of substantially different angle or take on, on, uh, on uh, um, yeah, how, 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 to lead, how to lead a life in these very, very complex and difficult times that we're facing, right? Right. So let me jump that right in there because I, I, I read it and I loved it. I think it's a perfect, it's a very enjoyable book. Um, and it comes out in the new year beginning, January, or what, what was it? Yeah, yeah, it should, should be out on January 1st, uh, depending a little bit on, uh, on how long it takes to get the, the proof copy. But may, maybe the print might take a little longer, but at least the Kindle should be out January 1st. Okay, so um, what I liked about this idea that it's very in a way embodied and it's not filled with meta theories you know we it's it's not about you know sociological theories it's not particularly or specifically about metamodernism it just jumps right in there so what i would like to do in our talk talk now is to go and kind of look at the generator function like how and why did you come to certain conclusions why how did you come to certain rules you know, and, and so that would be like something that would interest me very much because you don't write about it in the book. So, uh -huh. um, and so what I first noticed is that you came out of the closet, basically, as a deontologist, like Jordan Peterson. Is that correct? A deontologist, as a deontologist, you mean uh, in, the, in the moral uh, philosophy? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was an unexpected question, actually. It, it, or, or uh, did you want to? Did you want to add anything else to to the question? No, I mean I, that was just joking, you know, because yeah. it's like a deontologist yeah. is concerned yeah. about rules and behaviors, and you have. I mean, it's a simplified version. Then you have the theolog theologists who are more concerned about goals and you know mm -hmm. something like that, but. Mm -hmm. There's a, I mean, Jordan Peterson wrote obviously the book 12 Rules for Life, which is very much about rule driven. And so, but I mean, it's a kind of a joke, but it's also a question do you identify as a deontologist? Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, uh, so, and just for, for listeners, deontologists would be um, where, you, um, where you think something is good or bad right or wrong in and of itself right um it's um, or per definition and that sort of defines um that sort of defines whether or not you should do it like so Kant. this Kant was a deontologist exactly right? such as such as the german philosopher count right yeah. and uh, the question the answer is yes and uh, or or uh, there, there's a very big yes and in, in my, my uh, response to your question, namely that I am a, um, a, a fractal ethicist. So in, in the this goes outside of the outside of the scope of the book, and uh, I, I suppose we'll, we we will just have to settle with having a little bit more complex discussion than than the. Than perhaps other presentations <laughs> of this book, etc. Uh, given that you ask such difficult questions, right? Uh, but the, the underlying theory 
uh, of, of the rights and wrongs that, that you're seeing the surface phenomena represented as, as sincerely ironic invitations to, to, to obey, obey commands or follow rules, 12, 12 rules that you have to sort of follow to, um, and to have a, uh, a medio, a sublimely mediocre life, an okay life, right? Um, it is the, the, the underlying principle is that, yes, for personal relationships and for everyday life, um, th we have to adhere to virtue ethics, not to utilitarianism. Uh, because if we, if we woke up every morning and tried to calculate the good or bad outcomes of our actions, uh, for, for as many people or, or uh, sentient beings as possible, uh, first of all, we would be stuck calculating all the time, and uh, that would be rather dysfunctional. Second of all, we would tend towards a sort of, um, a sort of um, uh, instrumental view on life. Right? And third of all, or third, um, we, and this is the most important point, we would miscalculate all the time because it's so, because reality, life has so many moving parts and right. so many variables that are so difficult to, to, to define and pin down and, or causal structures that are largely invisible to us so that we would miscalculate pretty much all the time in terms of the actual effects of actions, like you get hit by a car, turns out was the best thing that ever happened to you. Uh, I mean, you, you seriously don't know, right? Uh, and fourth, if we then calculated and miscalculated and we have that as the ethical, uh, as the ethical demand on ourselves, we would be pretty angry with ourselves all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and blame ourselves for all the, the miscalculations we've made because we always miscalculate. We cannot calculate um, in this complex moving world uh, the, the actual effects of, of actions. I mean, down to simple, like, like with one of the best intelligence agencies in the world, Mr. Putin thinks he can invade Ukraine. It's going so-so. It is not yeah. going according to calculations. The calculations are difficult. The Ukrainians have five times the uh, the armament they started with uh, at the beginning of, of the war, most of which they captured from the Russians when they had to uh, flee uh, due to uh, collapsed logistics, right? Uh, so, so, I mean, you can't calculate even, even, even such things, right? Even when you have the best information available, right? Mm. Um, so... So where does that land us, right? In, if, in the fractal of ethics, it doesn't mean that utilitarianists, that, you know, making, it, it, do, doing what's best for everyone uh, right. is, is always bad. It just means that perhaps it doesn't belong on the day-to-day -day personal level. It rather seems to belong to, uh, to uh, well, urban planning, and public policy, um, well, the just economics, or 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 uh, um, uh, or, or just uh, economic distributions of policy, investment stuff like that, right? Uh, maybe right. maybe at a company level as well. You can you can think in, in terms of utilitarian calculations. Let However, me just, let, let me jump in there because it's interesting. Yeah. What you said. So yeah. again, uh, my impression of the book was. Obviously, you know, the first impression, it's, it's about rules. It's about the ontology, rules that are in themselves good and provide the most benefit, let's say. And mm -hmm. then uh, I also had the feeling that you are driven by a vision, right? And so yeah. because you, you haven't, you, you don't really express it because you don't really talk about metamodernism in the book. But I feel that the, the rules serve a kind of purpose which makes it not entirely deontological it makes it a, a mixture between deontological and teleological like goal driven and so you talk about you talk about calculation it's a form of heuristics where you need the rules and the goal in order to um, orient yourself properly you know going into the future is that what you want to say yeah yeah uh, some something like that i mean a uh... 
Yeah, if, if you think about it, deontology is sort of the base of ethics, right? First, you have to figure out what's right and wrong in the first place. So, you know, what, what to calculate from there on in a particular situation that you have to understand. You have to situation, you have to situationally uh, or contextualize a certain person, um, a certain agency, a certain form of action. And then you can say whether or not something is according to the virtues, according to, um, according to the principles that would guide good, good action in that context, right? Yeah. And from there on, you can uh, calculate, um, from, from there on, you can, you can set the rules for uh, the norms for society, the social, the social contract. And once you have the social contract, in place, then you can be a utilitarian. So the cr critics against utilitarianism, they always say, well, what if uh, we could uh, burn one person at the stake and calm the, uh, calm the public down? Uh, would, wouldn't that be a, uh, and wouldn't that be a positive utilitarian calculus? Well, yeah. utilitarian calculus cannot breach the social contract, right? So, so, so they're sort of emerging from one another and even um, even for, for us to be able to have a good to maximize, we first need to uh, the ontology, right? Uh, on the other hand, whenever agency is there, right? So as soon as we, as, as soon as we set some sort of directionality for life, some sort of right or wrong sort of ethics, uh, some, some sort of good that we want to achieve in our lives, um, of course, life, action and thought, and interaction become goal oriented, right? right. Uh, and the goals of, of uh, Tom and Mark and Daniel Gertz won't be the same ones, but the better our goals align, the more harmonious uh, our relationship tends to be because the more we can trust each right. other. And, um, so, and it's really the alignment of goals. This is a really strong and deep principle throughout the book, you might have noticed, right? Yeah. The alignment of goals is what creates trust and that really creates a richness of life, right? Because, right. I mean, you're not free when you don't have mutual trust. I mean, no matter how many how many rights you might have on paper, how much money you might have, it's, I mean, freedom is just, it's, it's, a, it's a derivative of mutual trust to a very, very, very large degree. And to have mutual trust, I mean, it's not enough that Tom is nice and Daniel is nice if we're nice people, um, because... If we're nice, but at the end of the day, we have the exact opposite interests, we will know, we know that what is good for Tom will be bad for Daniel, right? Mm. And at the end of the day, those, those things will, will win out. So, mm. so it is by, by getting to know each other and by aligning our interests that we can create common goals, right? And so, so when I formulated my 12 rules, um, it was really, it was really with this in mind that if you follow them, if Tom follows them and Daniel follows them, there should be an increasing likelihood that they um, th th that our goals align, that there is a that, that, that we increase the harmony of the whole game, yes. right? improve upon upon the game that we're playing, that it goes in the direction away from the direction of competition, away from the direction of betrayal and so forth, um, and in the direction of mutual trust and cooperation, and even beyond co cooperation into play, right? In cooperation, in that principle, you still have, um, in cooperation, you still have a sort of seriousness to it, right? So it's like, I have your back, you have mine. But but we still need to be a little bit tense about it, right? Because, because hey man, don't if you if you lose if you lose grip here, I will fall and die, right? So so that's cooperation. Have you, have but you play read uh, the book? Is even more... go, uh, the book well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Tom. From, you, have you read you the book say? Critical Path from Buckminster Fuller? That's like one uh, no, of the, no, I, I, did, I didn't read this. I didn't read this. So that, that's his idea of a critical path. You know, I, mm -hmm. I consider him like a, a kind of an integral thinker of some sort, a hugely influential book about what happens if, if a society is driven by a kind of goal and he uses the, you know, the build up to the, to the moon landing 
as a critical path, not only the astronauts and the NASA were engaged in, but, you know, all the politicians and the, you know, the, the people in the buildings that keep the, you know, the, all, the whole machinery running. Mm -hmm. And so, and so everybody was working on all levels with this kind of goal where we like with a very tiny and shitty computer yeah. send yeah. some people to, to the moon. And, mm -hmm. and so the powers that it can unleash. And so for Buckminster Fuller, the ideas that we could achieve so much if there would be like a, a coherence of, of people towards a certain goal. And, and I mm -hmm. kind of always missed that in our society. You know, it's like we're always like kind of, we're, we're not really a culture of visionaries, you know, it's like, no, or like a heroic culture that says, no, let's collectively go in that direction. It seems strange to me that we're not, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, I, I mean, I guess so, somehow these things. I, I remember. I mean, I didn't, I didn't read uh, Buckminster Fuller's book, but, but um, this is just, just from everyday life. You have conversations with people, and uh, you mentioned something that needs to change in everyday life that isn't okay or that could be different, and people will, in all seriousness, say, "But I'm just a normal person." So, so you sort of have a fictitious idea that there's some sort of hero somewhere else, right? Or, you know, like a Martin Luther King, some, some, some sort of legend, some sort of like a real pro or some, some great individual, right? I'm not saying individuals can't be great. I guess they can. Um, but but it's greatness is more common than you think. Um, and, and I mean, if we then flip it around and we look at say Martin Luther King and uh, we just look at his vices and flaws and so forth I mean there were there were a lot of them right um, so and, and many of which are fairly pathetic right and and, and, and uh, you know we we normal people we know would do better right than, than that right? in, in those regards uh, so so people feel that if I'm normal, I can't also be the hero uh, or I can't also be part of this heroic journey. And we sort of have to make up our minds, right? Oh, will I leave everything behind? Like uh, Nassim Taleb, um, I'm just trying to read his book now, Anti-Fragile, actually, I never came around. I love that. Yes. Uh, but, but, he, he, uh, but my friend would, gave me the book the other day. He said, come on, and you have to read. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so, um, so he talks about dogs versus wolves, right? But it doesn't make sense, actually, right? The dogs are wolves and the wolves are dogs. It's, it's like that. I mean, we do normal people, entirely normal people who are mediocre in so many regards still can do great things or be part of great things and so forth right uh, and and do and have real meaning in their lives around uh, around those uh, in in that regard and um and that's that's sort of one of the main topics of the book you don't first have to clean your room and then you'll be this better person and then you'll go out there no very wounded wasted normal anti-heroic semi-pathetic broken limited people get together and do things uh interesting things interesting things that are worthwhile right, right. um however you have to work on that on that basis um, and that that normal normality of life and then it, it's just, I mean, it's, it's similar but parallel to, to what Peterson is saying, right? Because if you, if you accept that you, you are okay being mediocre, no matter how good, a, you know, a writer you become, if you put up a secret camera and follow yourself around for a while or you get actual data on how you did spend your time and so forth. It's, uh, it's not going to be that impressive all the time, let's be honest, right? For pretty much anyone. No, that's the rule. The, the better you become in one area of life, mm -hmm. the higher the chances that you suck in all the yeah, other Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and it's it sort of 
then it's sort of okay that that's the case. <laughs> but if you work on and if you work on that mediocrity and you can make it actually pretty good, the mediocrity can be sublime, right? That's that's the idea. The, the whole idea of the book is we polish that mediocrity, right? There are already so many books. I'm like, oh, you're going to be the bestest of everybody and, and you're going to be exceptional. And they promised all these things on the first pages, right? And in this book, I promise you, you will become, you will wake up to an entirely ordinary life, right? <laughs> and, and, and this is a promise, guys, I can keep. <laughs> given <laughs> given that most self-help books don't keep their promises. I keep this promise. You will wake up to an entirely ordinary life, right? And I think actually that's something we need these days <laughs> because life isn't very ordinary anymore. If people have noticed, it's, it's so crazy and so wild and so interesting and so sad and so confusing and there are so many ways of us for us to 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 hone our talents and do exceptional things have you looked on pinterest by the way like the explosion of contemporary art that is not in the galleries how much talent is out there it's it's so mind-boggling uh, how how much exceptional colorful explosion of, of just creativity and right. imagination and everything else is out there right here right now right and at the same time the world is going to is going pretty south right and, and things are going really crazy right uh so somehow we need to anchor that normality again and i think this is what peterson wants too but i think he does it slightly the wrong way uh, with this, okay, uh, let, let us jump in yeah. because let, let us address the elephant in the room, Jordan yeah. Peterson. Yeah. Um, and so th that's the thing that I also very much liked in your book. So because if you look at the right and left spectrum and, and the far left, the far right, mm -hmm. one side, the, the right is kind of omitting, you know, future potentials always, you know, and the left is kind of omitting, you know, the wisdom you can find in deep traditions. Mm -hmm. And so, but what, what you do in your book is like you, you give... The devil or Peterson, it's doomed when you say, Oh, you, you, uh, understand and acknowledge a lot of his rules, kind of. And sometimes what you do in your book, you inverse his rules, right? And so when you, it's like, uh, for him, it's a lot about order and you say, clean up your room. And for, for you, it's, it's the other way around. Okay. You need a little bit chaos to, you know, to, to be creative and to stir up the shit, you know? And so. I find that very interesting. So, yeah, uh, I, I mean, and, and, yeah, and so what? What's your what's your thought about this? Mm, yeah, I mean, I, it depends on which which level you ask. I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer on on the more complex level. Given, I mean, maybe the sort of listeners that are on your pod and so forth. But uh, um, the, the the sort of the, the somewhat more complex answer that actually goes beyond either what I do in this book or that Peterson does his um, is um, is that actually all rules that say be be X be y be more this be more that are bullshit rules uh, because life is never reducible to an injunction in that manner right <laughs> there's just no there's it, it, the, the actual, the actual uh, rule, if you if you wanted one, would have to be some sort of algorithm or computer with an input, and then uh, a lot lots of ifs and buts and uh, uh, maybe nonlinear equations and so forth, and then would output, depending on a lot of different uh, uh, con contexts, a lot like variables or input, it would give different answers. So for somebody, it is go fucking clean your room, get a haircut, right? And for somebody else, it's going to be, okay, actually, you're cleaning your bathroom with a toothbrush and you, you're, you're, this is procrastination. <laughs> you promised yourself, you, you got lots of money from a foundation to go and save the world. Why are you cleaning the bathroom with a toothbrush, right? And telling yourself that you're setting the basis for, for, for the world changing. No, you are not. You are procrastinating, my friend. Go back, <laughs> do your real work. Uh, and and you, you're going to find all sorts of things. So, so there's, no, there's no real 
answer. I'm, I, obviously, this first rule that is a reversal is just because if somebody said A, and and it's an obviously incomplete picture, you can always just say B, and then you sort of complete the picture, right? So uh, so he says, well, more order in your everyday life, and uh, and uh, then then somebody else can come along and say, well, there's also the case for B, uh, which means. Uh, uh, seeing the downsides of order, seeing how order can be trapped, sound, is, is, is seeing uh, how uh, chaos, uh, creativity and, and messiness and tend to correlate even causally so you can actually mess up your desk and you can be a little bit more creative. Uh, you'll also be a little bit more miserable, but you will be a little bit more creative. Uh, and um, it, and also that they have shown in experimental psychology, right? I, I cited a bunch of studies, right? This, my favorite one is... <laughs> There, there, there is a there's a survey, and they ask people on stuff like um, pornography and uh, smoking. Like, uh, how harsh would you like? What do you think about people who smoke in front of blah 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 or stuff like that? And they spray on half of the survey. They spray um, like a detergent, something called Lysol, which exists in the United States, I suppose. And um, so it smells fresh. And the people who have this, the fresh, uh, the, the, the fresh smelling paper sheets, they will judge others harsh, right? Uh, so, so there is a sort of cleanliness uh, bias as well, and we should be aware of that too. Um, so, it's, 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 but at the end of the day, I'm of course playing with that first rule. It's the least important one, and it's right. just just to start off a little bit of fun dynamics given. There's another book that's really famous that talks about these things. Sure. Um, but, uh, but my real opinion is, of course, I don't have an opinion on it, right? You, you, have, to, uh, you have to do um, what's, uh, uh, you have to do what's appropriate. And that's sort of where I land in that chapter too. And the farther you progress in the book, you see, the book on the surface level, it's, it's a simple thing. You follow a bunch of rules, but the rules are increasingly complex and increasingly um and increasingly uh, uh, abstract uh, i suppose uh, and they go deeper and deeper into you and your life right so to so to achieve this ordinary life is a heroic feat actually um, okay, so to, and, and even because, yeah yeah uh, because i think that's that, that's a question that i wanted to ask in any case yeah. so as a sociologist so if you look at people and rules, are there mm -hmm. any studies or stats uh, of, um, in, you know, highlighting in which way we are actually able to adopt, adopt new rules? Mm -hmm. Or if we are, you know, only able to adopt some rules if they kind of appeal to us, to our bias anyhow? You know, it's like, because I, if like, you, you get what I'm saying? So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. What's what's your take on that? Yeah, so so, so uh, I mean, um, I don't want to say I'm a transformational pessimist, but I'm a transformational realist. Or so 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 I believe that uh, transformations are possible. Given and it, I mean, at, at, at the end of the day, transformation is the real face of the universe. Um, there's a sort of constancy, maybe. Of certain core principles, but as Wilbur Ken Wilbur said, we literally evolved from dust to Shakespeare. So don't come tell us transformation is not possible. Um, it always is. However, the fact that transformation is possible and happens over billions of years or tens of years even does not mean that every instance of wishful thinking around transformation is arbitrarily possible, right? So, so there's the potentials are endless, but they're not. Uh, the potential is endless, but it's but it's not an infinity of infinities, right? There's uh, there's a uh, there's a limited number of infinities that that, that are possible, right? Uh, and there 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 are also uh, things that that are not possible for for in terms of psychological transformation and so forth and sociological transformation even more. So uh, I well in terms of studies, I'm not entirely uh, uh, sure what to to refer to, but let me mention these few uh, arguments that um, it's very well known in, in uh, behavioral science that 
attitudes very rarely change once they're set, right? If you, once you have an identity, once you have an interest, it's very, very difficult to just change your mind just because you heard something or a new argument. Right. If, if you're a pig farmer and uh, a vegan shows up like myself and says something about, well, you know, it has the cognitive capacity of a two-year-old or whatever, right? Um, and um, all, all studies indicate that this is a suffering being. Uh, of course, they're not going to listen. Uh, and, uh, and if somebody shows up with uh, really conservative arguments and a uh, fairly liberal person such as myself, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it takes many repetitions at least uh, to be convinced and you have to right. really, really be uh, at fault, right, to, uh, to, 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 to change your position. However, um, in, in a, f a former book, uh, it's, it's called Nordic Ideology. It's about it's about a sort of political sociology. Um, there, there, uh, uh, me and the co-author there do tease out different different dimensions of uh, of sociological change. Right. So we say like free, there's there's the freedom uh, dimension and. Uh, the equality dimension, but there is also the developmental dimension of the population, developmental demographics, given like our, in medieval Europe, people would find it entirely normal to stone people to death on the square, We and then maybe maybe impale their heads on on, uh, right. on poles and around the city gates. And people are like, well, well that, this seems perfectly reasonable. He was stealing stuff. We shouldn't have done that. And now, now thieves will think twice before they, right? And, and this was just a thing. And everybody thought that was entirely normal. For us, that appears completely insane. And... Uh, and yeah, but just when you look at, you mentioned medieval times, so yeah. the, I think the Europeans, you may this know better than me, but one of the first books of law, you know, I think like, this is a German book stemming from the 14th century, like regulating theft and all mm -hmm. of this. And that was so strange to the people that they would like constantly wield, you know, so they were bound to the ground and, you know, like a, like a torture technique. Yeah. Like so, so to just get the rules in, like collectively. Oh yeah, no, yeah. We can't, you know it's it's super strange, you know, yeah, to yeah, think yeah. about it. But yeah. it also highlights how difficult it is to adopt yeah. completely new rules. So exactly. obviously, not, not everybody can adopt all rules. You know, yeah. so it's very, it's very, it's a very delicate civilization. Process. There's there's uh, the process called. Or, or the, the phenomenon called social, social inertia, right? Because if right. everybody else around you is acting in a certain manner, if you start acting differently and it's also very ingrained, it's, it becomes very difficult, right? Um, to, to just change the rules uh, or, or change the norms. So, right. but what I, but the interesting part is though, uh, that is that the norms are not the same as the developmental demographics, right? So developmental demographics that people have certain traits that they're maybe in our tape. I mean, you know, you and I both know about these developmental models. I'm not sure how, how listeners, uh, how familiar listeners might be, but developmental psychology uh, says, for instance, in a modern society, people will have individualist values, achiever values, they will believe in science, they will have a certain level of education and other things like that, and they might believe in democracy or free speech and human rights, stuff like that, right? Uh, which people before, was, was it really on their map or, or for Europeans before, at least I should say. So these, uh, instead they had other virtues, um, maybe charity, piety, humility, generosity, so so, so forth, right? Uh, and um, and these and honor, of course. Uh, so, so these different uh, this this developmental demographics of the population is not the same as the norm system. The norm system, according to uh, uh, to uh, uh, the big sociologist of norms as uh, civil society is called, uh, uh, or one of them is called Jeffrey Alexander, an American sociologist, and he uh, particularly defines norms as, as binary, as a rule that decides collectively what is pure or impure. And 
people tend to mix these two things up very, very, very much. So if you look at a country like Sweden, for a long time, we had, um, we had artificially enhanced uh, the progressiveness of the norms of the population, right? So, so that it became ta because cent central uh, arenas were won or battle symbolic battles in the central arenas were won by postmodern values, anti racism, environmentalism, feminism, and so forth. It became really, really, really taboo to to speak out against those values, or to, for instance, be against immigration or uh, stuff like that. And if you were, you were punished or penalized, you, you might ruin your career or, you know, just just be chastised in the press or other, other things like that, right? And, um, and people were very quick to attack and, and get that you know, score score points on on, on the, the perpetrators against these norms. Eventually, during the the uh, uh, refugee crisis, uh, Sweden took in uh, proportionally a very 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 large amount of uh, of Syrian refugees in 2015 right. and and the following year. And uh, eventually, this whole thing turned upside down in a matter of weeks. So the the entire population went from being doggedly anti-racist to being anti-immigration. The entire population like this. I was part of this dynamic to a certain extent too, even though I had talked about uh, how it works in, in the first book. But but even I was also uh, affected by this, by this okay. term. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, so, so, so I mean, I, I, I feel more comfortable now saying that we should reduce immigration. That makes makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the norms shift, uh, um, and the population didn't suddenly regress in terms of their psychological development. The more probably they're showing their real face. And Sweden now has the biggest, or one of the biggest, right wing parties, right? Or, or uh, who are literally the former Nazi party, right? And now they say they're social conservatives, but um, I'm trying to throw out Nazi members and so forth. Uh, but but it is a, a fairly right wing uh, populist party, even in a European, pan-European right. context, right? And... Um, and they, they don't have rallies, but they have festivals and all of the all of those things, all those paraphernalia of, of the far right. Um, so um, it's it's an interesting thing that the thing that was so taboo that was entirely unthinkable in Sweden turns like that, and that's because yeah. the norm system is not the same as the developmental psychology, right? But the developmental psychology is actually what determines the real social dynamics. Right, so uh, if we really, if we're really serious about transformation, we should focus less on norms and rules and more on developmental psychology. And just to bring back to the to the beginning of this discussion or to the beginning of this uh, or to, of your question, what, what about a book with with rules? Ah, so the rules aren't actually rules or or laws or commandments. You can you can play with them that way can play with them in your mind that way and uh, but but they are um they are steps towards uh to towards um, um a healthy a healthy psychological life right a, a a good basis for 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 inner development but uh, or for for just uh, healthy relationships, right? Uh, where the real action happens, right? So so this particular book is not written to raise your your uh, stage uh, in terms of your your values or your norms. It's just to create the basis for you to do so or to to develop in whatever direction is is good for you and the people around you, right? Oh, okay, so that's interesting. But let me ask you uh, something, because how did you, I mean, like, okay, so given what you just said, how uh, how did you come up with these rules? How idiosyncratic are they? That's the question, because like when I was reading through all the rules and I was like, yeah, that makes kind of sense, right? Uh, but then again, you could say you can completely make up different rules, right? You could make rules like, I don't know, 
love hard, play hard, work hard, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you know yeah. something like that. You, so perfectly fine rule. Or like live your diamond or, you know, engage in uh, anti-climate change rallies or whatever. It's like you could, you could make up, given the crisis uh, that we are facing now, you could make up completely different rules. So how did you come up with, with these 12? And again, how idiom idiosyncratic are they? From your own uh, point of view, I, I mean, in, in 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 the larger in a larger scheme of uh, of potential, they're fairly idiosyncratic, but they're not arbitrary. So, so idiosyncratic means uh, that you could have done different rules, right? right. Uh, and, but if you change one of them, you'd have to change all the others a little bit. So, so they're non-arbitrary in the sense that there is an internal structural logic to them, right? Um, however, um, the, the, the writing process or discovery process was fairly intuitive here that uh, um, just, just um, write down, write down, um, at this uh, point in your life, the the highest practical wisdom that you have, right? And they are coming from a position of disillusionment with uh, the progressive spiritual um, wisdom culture that we are seeing in the West today, right? Uh, so, so it tries to uh, extract right so, so some of some of the perspectives from there but also add a lot of skepticism and uh and just just ordinary common sense just grounding the wire uh, because i really think we are on the cusp of some sort of spiritual uh higher potential in our culture um, it might not materialize, given we're under so much pressure and so much confusion these days. But but it's it's un in unmistakably there, right? That so many people are noticing that hey, wait a minute, there appears to be some sort of post-religious, some sort of post-theological, or uh, or digital age spirituality or or or, or religion or something beyond atheism and religion available to us. There appears to be a certain reappropriation of what wisdom traditions they are open to us. There appears to be a meeting of science and spirituality. This can this has profound implications for how to live life and so forth. And once you get into all of these groups that you and I are part of, what you see is a considerable fallout or failure to uh to materialize or to, to 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 harvest the fruits of that potential you see people getting into cults you see people um getting into uh, uh tunnel vision with their one favorite idea you see people getting into uh excessive uh, networking never getting uh, stuff done you see everybody trying to platform everybody else uh, and trying to get everybody to join their project you see everybody chasing the rich people you see people crashing health-wise, uh, mental or physical health. Um, and there's something fairly off there. Um, and, and these are people who have done lots and lots of therapy, meditation, embodiment, uh, those, um, you know, psychedelic uh, plant medicine, and so on and so forth. And they and they read their Erich Neumann and they, they know all the books of Jung. Um, what, and they might be environmentalists and, and you know, environmentalists or Buddhist economics. There are all these things, and it's, I mean, as a group with or this this change maker class full of such exceptional people is failing, right? Um, so the rules are particularly, I mean, sure, I'm sure they have bearing on other groups as well uh because the the time the the times we're in are uh, well ha ha present certain challenges to all of us um but but it's particularly to let's bring this group a little bit back to reality it's it's of course my own journey there as well you dive into all of this crazy stuff and uh, right. you feel like wow we're gonna do this and this and that and then 
you see, I'm well, not, not exactly what I was hoping for, expecting. Right. Uh, not from myself or not from other people and not from particular the collective, right? So maybe we should go backwards and just, just do a more commonsensical, more grounded version. Maybe marriage with, with the, the acceptance of ordinary life. Maybe we've been trying to run away from ordinary life a little bit uh with all with all of these uh um uh, you know spiritual adventures and and uh, world saving plans and platforms and projects and uh, progressive companies and uh, uh interesting interesting topics we're exploring together and and intellectual discussions right and network meetings and all of those things that are that are important and maybe crucial for for the survival of uh, of our civilization eventually but maybe we're not doing so well uh, just just mental health wise <laughs> uh and maybe that oh, I get you. yeah yeah I, I get you but the question i was kind of re getting at was you know let's say let's call it the generator function or function or the mm -hmm. light motif that you had mm -hmm. to select you, you described it that you know, they're not arbitrary, those rules. They belong together. If you change uh -huh. one, you need to change uh -huh. the whole structure. So uh -huh. what was the light motif for that structure? Uh -huh. right? I mean, so and so there's a generator. So what uh -huh. what is the core idea? I, 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 again, I, I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously, there's a, obviously there's a, a bit of a spoiler alert in, in, in this sort of thing. But the farther you progress into the book, um, the the more the more of that uh, generated function might be, become apparent, right? Uh, I, I think you said you read eighty percent of it, so you didn't may, maybe finish the last chapter or something. Um, Could be yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So 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 a lot of it is revealed there, but all right, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you but if you um, if you look at it, there is a sort of movement towards a higher principle that underlies uh, that underlies the worlds and and it's a sort of existential uh, it's a sort of existential uh, attitude of uh, of a forgiveness i guess you could say right that uh, that in that being in love with life or, or having a healthy relationship to existence is really about forgiving uh, everything really and uh, the different aspects of it, right? You're not going to forgive everything if you're not grateful for the pleasure that you actually get to sense in this life and body. That would be rule two: fuck like a beast. I won't trust you if you don't. If you can't fuck like a beast, right? Right. Uh, and uh, if you there's a rule uh, about uh, about uh, the body mind and how to how to take care of it. And if you don't do that, you, you cannot contain the difficult enough emotions for you to be able to forget, right? If you uh, if you are not good at quitting in time, resentment builds up like nothing else in your body and your mind and your thoughts and in the very <laughs> structure of your thoughts, right? Yeah. Uh, so you have to be good at seeing now's the time to quit even if it's painful, even if it's difficult, even if it also creates anxiety, don't stick around in a relationship that is harming you and other people. Yeah. Uh, when when somebody's being, being parasitic uh, or, or somebody is being abusive or something just doesn't serve the parties involved, you have to be good at quitting, right? Because that's how you take care of your inner child. The adult has to say, okay, I'm going to take care of you, right? Yeah. And uh, the signs that we have that we're we don't quit enough, right? Uh, is in, is is are apparent because people quit hysterically sometimes, right? And they abandon even their own children. Well, my my argument is not this is because we quit too much in in our day and life day and age. It's because we don't quit in time. So we do it. so when once we start doing it, we overdo it. We don't know how to do it, right? Um, or if you cannot work through your own difficult emotions of guilt and shame, right, and really accept them, so uh, there is uh, there is uh, a chapter named "Do the Walk of Shame," 
a sort of commandment. You must do the walk of shame, right? And what bring what this brings up to mind is maybe that thing from Game of Thrones where a woman, like a, the queen or something, has to walk right. down the streets or whatever. It. Shame, 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 right? It, but <laughs> but you don't have to do it publicly. You just have to admit to yourself how many things you're pretty damn ashamed of, right? Mm. And there's even a whole anti-self structure you probably have, right? Then sometimes when you really don't like what, what somebody said about you or how they looked at you, it's probably because you think they saw you in that manner that you really don't want to be seen, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that you were seen, actually. And maybe that's fairly apparent to other people. Like you have to work through that shame, right? And just accept it. And you can do it actually on your own. You just yeah. have to look at the shame right if if you don't if you don't actually lift all of those weights from yourself how can you at the end of the day score a goal on the other far side of the of the field which is the forgiveness right you can't just wake up at 5 a.m in the morning and forgive uh everything and everyone uh, because if you try you're doing uh, spiritual bypassing right so, uh, so so the the higher or the deeper principle is it works towards your capacity to not be pissed off at life and not be pissed off at god right and there's even a theological uh, argument to that that maybe mainstream christianity has it backwards it's we're we're all obsessed about okay uh jesus came down to the world and through his blood god forgives us right but we can, might, maybe we need to take the power back so i mean okay god is pretty he, he, he created a pretty messed up world and i'm i've been pretty upset frankly you know i've been pretty upset by a lot of things that happened to me to happen to other people and to happen to animals and other sentient beings and just just how messed up a lot of things are if you don't forgive god then you're always a little bit angry right on some level and maybe it's not even realistic to entirely forgive uh you know the highest principle of everything uh but it, it's it looks like a viable goal so it's a sort of religion uh that is i mean there's a theology packed into this there's a sort of existentialist philosophy let me, let me uh, I'm, I'm sorry let me jump in before i forget this um, yeah. question because it's so interesting what happens if rules are conflicting because you had just said say no and forgive what happens if you mix them two together sometimes you can't say no to forgiveness also uh -huh. you don't uh -huh. want to be too ironic when you fuck like a beast so you know yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. so what do you do there uh, so, so i mean life is rich so so it doesn't mean that uh, if, if there is an apparent uh, contradiction usually it has, is the answer is in, in sequentiality right so I'm not sure that the sequentiality is exact in the, the, the 12 book in the 12 rules um that that uh, that we proposed but but it is um a little bit uh, uh there at least or to a certain extent it's there um the the sequentiality that aha uh -huh, first before so fuck like a beast comes before uh, uh be sincerely ironic right, right. and sincerely ironic doesn't mean if you look if you zoom in on it it is that you use the irony to reach greater sincerity right so right. so irony serves sincerity right and that's that's what i mean both and thinking is a bitch people don't get it right. that's why we have to work so hard with it right and, and and people seriously don't believe it it's like and every every time people get back to me all the time they're like yeah and uh maybe we should be ironic since uh, sincerely ironic not ironically sincere right but maybe it's about sincerity like dude that's the whole thing right? yeah <laughs> you will fail at your sincerity if you do not master irony irony is not for fun irony is a dead serious skill right, right. and uh, so 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 to be very concrete right fuck like a beast it, the book is the the, the the chapter is very little about sex but let's take the sexual part of it uh so um it's always uh, good so, for the so, podcast let's talk more about sex yeah yeah <laughs> always right <laughs> <laughs> we're selling tickets no anyway that that <laughs> that um 
uh, the erotic dominance, right? Uh, so, um, so, so, we, which for, from the male perspective is is so or hetero heterosexual perspective, male perspective is is, is often often in part important part of fuck like a beast, right? So, the irony um, of having a playfulness with the other party, which allows you to play with roles that wouldn't necessarily be appropriate uh, in, if there wasn't that level of mutual trust and playfulness, allows you to, within one of those playful, is this true, is it not true, both and superpositions, suddenly make transgressions that in other regards would be too much or would be potentially harmful or, or abusive, but now they're instead deeply pleasurable and very, very, very uh, strong experiences for both parties, especially actually for the receiving party. Right. Um, so just, just let me so, jump in there. Sorry, I yeah, always do yeah. this, but you know, yeah. you, I, it's, uh, from my perspective, these are two completely different sets of processes. Either mm -hmm. you fuck like a beast, and that comes mm -hmm. from the belly, and it comes from uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's the result of. Uh, transgressional effort and then the other processes be in that dialectical mind frame and so you can't well, be well, so, so, so I'm mind. saying so all I'm saying is sure but you don't just uh, fuck like a beast with uh, anybody you capture on the street right you, uh, there, there is a there is a dialect that leads up to it right and uh, given a richer array of possible roles to play with uh, of possible uh, of possible uh, uh, bodies or roles or personas to inhibit, inhabit, then then you can actually go back past your inhibitions more. That would be one argument, right? So, I mean, it depends on which level we look at, but there is a sequentiality sort of, right? That, right. Uh, uh, that uh, forgiveness comes last because it's the most important, but of course, going to can, it, it could strengthen all of the other rules as well. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, um, it, it, uh, did you mention any other, any other, uh, uh, any other? No, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just, it's, uh, I would think it's a, uh, it's a systemic kind of problem, but because like any set of rules is by nature creating the problem that the rules are conflicting because you can only follow one rule at the time, which put it at odds with all the other rules, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so, yeah. so, so I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, um, I mean, if, if you sort of hold the rules sincerely, ironically, uh, you, you can see how they sort of work towards a common goal and the common goal would be okay forgiveness is the other side of love and right. the, the deepest forgiveness that you can that you can muster or create will basically determine how much you can be in love with life right and um, but to get there you can't it's not a norm right you can tell yourself i should be forgiving right or you can right. even hypnotize yourself with the meditations and stuff or or suggestions self-suggestion that you are but it's yeah it's not going to be entirely trustworthy right and it's not going to be entirely uh, genuine um and uh you work through many different rules and and if you if you sort of triangulate your way to, uh, through them you can actually get more baseline happiness or peace in your life, right? Uh, yeah. And that's the sublime mediocrity, right? The, it's not about uh, it, it, life that contains all those peaks and valleys, right? It does, but a very large part of it is in this everyday existence that we're right. in. And if we can improve the basic, the baseline of that existence, uh, we will have become a lot healthier this is the idea right, right. Uh, and that's it's that sort of health or sanity that uh, that was that i've sort of seen lacking in our 
well, well in our time generally, but also particularly maybe in, in the life experience of people in our own networks, right? Um, so like, let, let me ask another question. So I think when, when we look at Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. last time I would mention him, and so his mm -hmm. book, I think like, you know, I think these two books that he wrote were so um, successful because of the way he selected the rules, right? And so as far as I understand, and I may be not correct, I think I'm correct. So he did like uh, originally this Quora vote thing, you know, where, where people upvoted and downvoted some rules. And that was like kind of a collective process by which he kind of extracted the first 12 rules. And it had the validity to itself that, people were kind of accessing, you know, their traditional kind of rules they were brought up on, right? Mm -hmm. And so and that made the book kind of, it was at least part of why the books were so important because the rules were kind of eternal. Let's say it like this Christian, whatever, right? So you speak about forgiveness now. So how much can you um, trace those rules that you make made Uh, uh, down to uh, you know older rules and in, in what sense are they completely new right so you mentioned for example be either or thinking that could be also like a new rule but that is a rule that emerged with the integral scene right so like how can, can you understand the question like yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so so, so um um, I mean, you, you keep asking all the questions that have that 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 are discussed in the last chapter, but but all right, <laughs> but 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 here we go. Uh, <laughs> it, look, look at eternal rules, right? So so there are four four different ways. This is this is also discussed in the last chapter, right? Uh, there are four different ways to look at religion or belief, right? Um, so you is... did something for me. It let something open, and now I'm talking about the missing part in the in the model. Obviously, yeah. it's the last chapter. But yeah. now here we are. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so there, there, maybe there was a higher higher purpose to 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 uh, you having almost finished the book, so we right. can talk about how this particular conversation. I was going to say uh, if four, four different four different ways of understanding religion, or three different ways that we are accustomed to, right? Uh, Number one is simply, you know, believing in a religion, whether or not you do it literally or, um, or, uh, or more, you know, playfully or metaphorically. It's like, I think I believe in God a little bit sometimes when I'm in church, when I had a kid or something like that. Or you just believe everywhere that says in the Bible. Well, you believe, right? You believe in God, right? Then there's atheism or, or uh, you know, far, far reaching agnosticism, which is basically atheism. Um, which is okay, all of that is from from former times before scientific thinking, and uh, obviously the stories are arbitrary and they're false and directly harmful oftentimes to believe in right um, and and delusions more or less right and then there is the third one, and it's aha, the religions are not they're they're not necessarily literally true um but they are depositories of transrational truth uh so or existential truth right and uh, I, th i think uh, we've seen for instance peterson uh, defend this uh, this uh, view many times and and i think um among among people such as ourselves this is the, the most common the most common view uh, and you can sort of ignore in this third view uh issues of belief or, or, or not belief, because the, the belief structure is viewed as a fairly, um, as a fairly superficial question, actually, right? Um, unless, unless the beliefs are, turn out to be directly harmful to somebody, et cetera, right? Uh, and then, uh, then, From, from this from this third perspective which i believe peterson also uh, also uh, extols and um, you would say that the rules that you're trying to derive including from from uh, religious studies or, or religious experience or existential insight are fairly eternal right now the fourth view that we're less accustomed to thinking in terms of is that the religions are not a belief structure, not 
uh, false either, and they're not existential truths, they are existential truth claims. Uh, that as any other truth claims uh, can be evolved, uh, can be false, uh, can, uh, can lead, lead to uh, religious or existential cul-de-sacs and uh, um, or, you know, because human, they, 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 uh, they do express archetypal human experience, but the reading of that experience can be false for the first, uh, to begin with. And also the archetypes themselves can actually have knots or, or, or paradoxes that, that need to uh, resolve over time and, ev and evolve, right? right. Uh, and that lead to deep suffering, right? Uh, in, 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 uh, before another another uh, truth claim, not another truth, is discovered, right? And I, I um, in terms of theology, I, I would subscribe to this fourth experience or this fourth fourth view of religions or belief, um, and. Uh, in, in this regard, I, I view the rules that I present as fairly new takes on old rules, right? So I believe that uh, we live in a certain time now, the internet time, or uh, with a certain uh, logic, with a certain gener new generator function of, of our collective uh, mind, including collective unconscious. Um, I believe uh, we are in such profoundly different uh, living conditions that we are at a point where even deep existential truths are being overturned um, and that the religions of the past they cannot just be repackaged right we need genuinely new religion right uh, so this is a, a common discussion uh verveki and um uh, and, well, everybody else, Jamie Wheel and uh, uh, our friend Nick Jankel and uh, Roberta Unger and uh, uh, the, the author of Faith, Faith of the Faithless, Simon Critchley. Critchley. Uh, uh, it, all, all of these things are, are coming up, right? And, and of course, a lot of pragmatic Buddhists also. Um, and, and of course, integral spirituality in all of its guises. The, the, the seeing the, this attractor point, and the attractor point is not a repackaging of the old religions. Because the life conditions are genuinely different, but also because our developmental psychology is different, and also because actually truths evolve, especially perhaps such truths, um, which is, by the way, congruent with the whole idea of evolution of God, which is also in, in uh, what's this guy, Robert Wright, book title evolution of god or or um or these archetypal ideas of a uh, matriarch of a uh, euroborus and through that sort of born a matriarch uh, neumann, through that yeah, sort of form. But yes mm -hmm. exactly and irish neumann but um all of those are actually evolutionary spirituality or 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 sean gebser for that matter so it would it be so strange if the theologies or post-religious theologies we write today uh, with the existential or religious uh, faith that is formulated are genuinely new or different. Of course, they're continuations of all the former. They have to be because nothing exists in a vacuum, least of all ideas or at least. Uh, um, and, uh, and there's a sort of um, satanic quality to that. Because uh, you're no longer, I mean, this is what Nietzsche said. Right? He said, new values are new tablets. He didn't say old wine and new bottles. Mm. Right? He could have said that. Right. Uh, but but we, what he said was, okay, death of God means genuinely, genuinely new transrational truth. And or genuine new transnational truth claims, I should say, from which values are derived, right? So there, there are some transnational truth claims, uh, trans not transnational, transrational truth claims uh, that underpin uh, my work and, and uh, many of these other authors, right? Um, 
but we're at the beginning and beginning of exploring them. However, once you have that sort of, once you have a few few such gener new generator functions as you particularly ask for, uh, you can download rules, right? So you can see, is this rule congruent with a larger generator function? Are these rules uh, congruent with one another? However, you understand and I understand that the rules are a surface phenomenon for something else that is going on, right? For, for a sort of uh, evolution or, or for a sort of revolution of, of, uh, of, uh, of spirituality, I suppose, right? One spirituality that has to become congruent not just with uh, with science in, in in the in the sense that I don't know there are so many even since the 1800s there are um, uh, societies w w which gather a lot of famous people and they want to find you know noetic sciences or sciences that that uh, would would show that spiritual experience is real and so forth right and and they are interested often in psychic phenomena no it, that that's actually not where I think we're going. I think we're going to a towards a religion that is congruent with actually atheism, right? <laughs> Which is weird, but but religion, some sort of religious atheism, more post atheism, more post religion, which nevertheless reintroduces faith. But of course, if we didn't know what faith was through former experience, if I never went to a church and I didn't uh, have those symbols around, I couldn't. I couldn't speak of a faith to 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 uh, uh, to remedy or to solve, and I wouldn't have the idea of the universality of forgiveness and so forth, right? Uh, so, is it new? Is it old? There's a <laughs> right. It, 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 uh, it's uh, it's obviously a both and, but but I I think there's an argument to be made for which which I think puts me di partly at odds with with the Petersonian conservatism. And and puts me on the progressive side of of, of a similar discussion um, for, for for novelty and maybe that is a vanity. But hey, I want to see where this vanity goes. I'm curious about it. Maybe it's just punishment. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, let, 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 let me jump in there because you mentioned yeah. now downloading, right? That was yeah, a, yeah. yeah. A, And so, as a, it's a, I think it's a question, you know, from fellow writer to writer. So, lead me through the process. I would, I would guess, like how, how do you download that kind of rule? It's like, do you get, you read a lot, and then you get in a state of meditation, and then you, you kind of concretize it or crystallize it. So, what's the process like uh -huh. in your case? And that's the first part of the question. And then the second part, because I mentioned being a writer, so I know when I write about a subject that it's, it's, I mean, like there's an the objective thing, the topic I try to explore, but I also explore something about myself. Mm -hmm. That's a re that's at least 50% of why I'm writing, right? So because I, it's a discovery process and, and it's also like a, The process of shaping myself. Uh -huh. So I give myself over to to the let's let's call it the unknown, right? So the unstructured space, and that makes that creates me, and I I create myself via writing, right? And so and I'm I'm different afterwards because I discovered something, and so that would be the second part of the question: How much did Uh, did these rules that you kind of downloaded your word um, shaped your internal self perception and how much do you kind of um, align yourself to these to these rules so um, um, I, I, can, I can start with the, with the last one so give or take um, I, I, I think I can say I, I can uh, I can uh, confidently say I, th these are rules that I that I live up. I mean, they, they are about mediocrity after all, right? Uh, so, um, so it, the, the last rule is walk towards forgiveness, right? Or play for forgiveness, right? It doesn't say forgive, right? I, I started out with that, but I had to change it, right? Yes. Uh, and do the walk of shame? Did I do that? Yes. I walk through my guilt and shame. Yes was actually fun. I can recommend people do it. It's fun. <laughs> and, um, 
You live in a mess? I can show you with a camera, guy, man. It's true. I do it. <laughs> Fuck like a beast. Okay, okay. You got me there. Not always. I mean, I have a little bit of a Well, so, uh, and, and, uh, but, but the, the chapter is only secondarily about that, right? I mean, it, it is about yeah. taking care of the inner child. And there is a journey that I also talk about there, and uh, which, which I do feel is, is, is uh, just, just honestly told. Uh, so, so, so the, yes, the rules do come from experience, and I even change the rules around through um, or, or, or some of the content or insight of them as, as things occurred in my life while during the writing of the book. Uh, that is also correct. Um, however, I mean, where do ideas come from, right? Um, and the, the, well, the people want to know the meat of things, Daniel. What do you do? <laughs> If you're like in, in that state of writing and you're like, yeah, yeah, oh, no, yeah, yeah. no, I, today is the day for the fourth rule, you know? Well, well, uh, no, I, I, today I, is I, the I, day I, for the fourth rule. Please, please appear, you know? How, uh, how does that happen? Uh, yeah, yeah, you mean, you mean like that, right? Uh, so, 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 um, um, uh, there, there's a mysterious thing here, right? I mean, Uh, you uh, did you ever come across a writer called um, um, I don't remember what it's called, but but he wrote a call, he wrote a book called The War of Art, not The Art of War, but The War of Art. Do you, do you recognize such a book title? Yeah. Stephen something. It's an American name, I think. And and this guy uh, he wrote about uh well basically the resistance that writers are in particularly experience and uh and somehow that there is and he he believes that there are sort of you know higher power muses that you can sort of capture and follow and then you have to defeat resistance and he tells us you know rather sad life as a writer who never made it and writing about how he never made it as a writer and how it overcome he works to overcome resistance he finally made it as a writer and this like is just exploded all across the world because <laughs> everybody wanted to write about it. how do you actually become like how do you actually follow your dream your heart right and he did it with such passion right this this writer and um there's a there's a reason that maybe i never stuck in the in the academic world so far so 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 so, so long um at a time um Because I work too, too intuitively, too impressionistically, and I think that you will recognize this if you're this sort of writer. You're, you're writing a novel right now, uh, and, finished, it's, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and it's uh, philosophical erotica or something like that. You, you were talking about that, and, and I mean, yes. yeah, and it, it has to sort of come from the farther edges of your mind, and you just get curious. <laughs> what happens if I go there? So, uh, so this particular book, right? I reined in. Uh, uh, I I reined in simply by just instantly. I I just knew the twelve rules. I just knew them, right? It's like, okay, what if I would write twelve rules? And I just wrote them down, right, like that. All right. I okay. had to change one or two of them eventually, but it was the same content, right? right. Uh, I just had to shift it around. Eventually, though, there, all of the rules are buckets, so I also shifted stuff around from the buckets, and then I explored their interconnections, right? And how, how does it work? Well, I don't know, but uh, there is a, there's, I mean, given that I have a certain life philosophy, and uh, which you know about from the other books and from our discussions earlier, you know, we've had a lot of, a lot of discussions many times, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it was just fairly apparent to me what, what, what the 12 rules would be. And then I just fill in the blanks, right? I, I just, I already knew what every chapter contains, right? right. And uh, a, there, there were three or four blanks though. So I talked, To, there's a rule about meditating in the book, right? About uh, rather than gurus, you need really close friendships that you sort of do all sorts of adventures with. And um, and uh, I just talked with a close friend. 
uh, through three, four, four and a half of the rules. Uh, uh, one, once I had a bit of writer's block, I thought I thought I had something to say here, but it's not interesting enough. And we just strike up a conversation, and I draw on other other people's minds. So this particular friend, Johan Ronnefors, um, he uh, he has a very uh, different sort of mind for me. Uh, so very, very abstract and very uh, mathematical and so forth and uh, background in computational science so he, and entrepreneurship. So he, so he draws from that, right? Uh, so through deep dialogue, uh, he would come up with, and he also, his right. mind just produces new stuff very, very easily. So I would just sort of sift through all of his crazy... Uh, uh, crazy, uh, uh, crazy suggestions and uh, and reject them. Eventually, he says something like, hmm, "Oh yes, this resolves actually the the thing." And this now I have enough said in this chapter, and this aha uh -huh, comes together. So there there is a process that is. I mean, I would really like to say transpersonal rather than co creative because it it is from depth psychology. Uh, that you just sort of know that if I already have this philosophy and these values, what I would say as 12 self-help rules would be these. And then you realize, okay, it's a little shoddy here and there. Uh, how do I add robustness to that? Uh, and you only notice that when you're writing it out because it looks, what you get in your mind is not the actual text. You get the zip files, right? Mm -hmm. You're just like, okay, there is a peak over there, there's a peak over there, there's a peak over there. You can walk in this landscape, you walk to these mountain ranges. But once you get close, you notice, oh, there's actually a valley before I got to that peak. I didn't know that. And then you need some help from your friends. And your friends are sometimes, your muses are sometimes your problems. So sometimes it's, it, it was because something was going on in my life and I had a big problem. And then I was like, wait a minute, did this makes me think of. And yeah, and just having the dialogue with myself, uh, let, letting this, let, letting this, you know, sort of inf infuse the, 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 the dialogue and that, People uh, wonder sometimes why there's so, so much flow in, in, in the text. And it's, of course, because it's not just me sitting there forcing writing. It's me expressing the inner monologue or dialogue mm -hmm. that I might have had for months, right? Right. Um, so, so it's just a continuation with different, you know, voices and, and stuff like that, right? Um so, so, so that would be the writing process is a very alive thing. And the more alive stuff you can capture and then structure and then bring down on paper and then put in a larger structure, the better, yeah. right? Uh, but, but other than that, of course, I think about writer stuff. I, I guess I shouldn't talk about that too much, though, because it's a little bit about like there's always a wizard of Oz. Uh, in every writing process and maybe you know off camera you and I as writers can talk about it but I, I don't like to talk about it publicly what you do to make stuff exciting or you know stuff like that I, okay no yeah. I get that so let us talk about yeah. something else I have another question so mm -hmm. you mentioned um, that we're living in new times with the internet and we're living in a times uh, where we have a multitude of crises right we have, yeah. climate change. We, have we have all these kinds of the war and uh, the meaning crisis and and stuff and so on and so but we like all in the same boat like everybody mm -hmm. left right mm -hmm. in the center left left of center right of center whatnot but at the same time you you mentioned that um you and i would say of myself as well we're more left leading right and so you 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 say that you, the rules that you kind of came up with or downloaded are also like kind of left leaning which, which I find appealing, but I don't know if in how, how do you address the problem that there are libertarians or right-wing people or even normal conservatives that also like are in that boat with us together and, you know, but maybe don't feel uh, the need to adopt these kinds of rules. You know, it's like even like a libertarian, a libertarian would probably say, or the, the libertine 
get the fuck out of with your rules here. I don't want your rules. Leave me alone. I just want to live my life, right? Yeah. But we are like, we are all in this together. And so there's a kind mm. of tension between... Mm. Yeah. So, so, so I'll, I'll tell our libertarian friends that uh, we're in it together as long as you do what I tell you. No, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's not that's not the response. Uh, so first of all, I mean, no, no artwork or no book is for everyone, right? It's it's. Um, uh, I mean, for for instance, uh, I'm breaking it, this sort of taboo here. Like the, the the intellectual left hate self help, right? So this is a book for not for them either. This is a book for absolutely no one, right? <laughs> Um, but uh, but um, Jordan Peterson uh, stuff already talks to that group, right? And it, uh, the, the problem with, with his stuff is that at the end of the day, it is from a conservative ideology, right? Uh, and then it's even in the examples he, he, he brings up. It's like if you read his second 12, 12 rule book, it's about okay, and there is this uh, there is this uh, example I need to bring up for no particular reason, and it was a woman who you know was pretty disturbed, and just so you know, she was vegan, right? And um, <laughs> and then it's like, and then I had an old friend who was pretty pathetic, and he was Buddhist, not Christian, Buddhist, and uh, environmentalist. Also, he brings up several times, and then politically correct people who are you know crazy harpies and so forth really? so, so okay. well, yeah i mean it, it's it's i haven't read that book. it's like that it's yeah it, it's like that i mean the, the whole thing comes with with this undercurrent of of course his political agenda right which is okay which is okay but so so, so there's that but also the this the logic of it is i mean it, it's in the conservative ideology right get up in the morning cut your damn job cut your damn here Go to work, right? And don't complain. Pay your damn taxes. Do hard work. Try to take some damn responsibility. Then complain. But you'll notice once you've done, done those things, you don't feel like complaining as much, right? Um, so, so, and that's that's a truth. Uh, there, there, There's a lot of truth to that, but it's like any other. Like, like I said in the beginning, it's, it's a... It, it can be true in some cases, in some cases not, right? It depends, yeah, depends, right? Um, on, on input variables, right? Uh, so we need to figure out the exact, the, the, the right, the right function to figure out what, who needs to become a little bit more conservative. So, um, his rules, nevertheless, are about finding some sort of structure or sanity or some sort of anchoring in this world. But given their political agenda or their political slant, first of all, they will lead to a world of more conservatives, uh, which actually isn't necessarily what we mean need right now. I know I know the Gen Z folks are um, more on this side, for instance, but I mean, the, the climate crisis is real. Um, we, we really need to rethink our institutions. We really need to. It's a matter of survival. So, so we can't really afford everybody just, you know, doing this career thing and, and all of that and stuffing new, new consumer goods in a villa. And, and uh, we really, really, really need to rethink things on a collective level. And I mean, that requires so thinking, right? Uh, so so one, one part of it is I, I don't want to contribute to this population of, of just new conservatives because it's the whole thing's going to crash and the other part uh is that well so all of the all of the progressives who don't like jordan peterson because of something he said about transgender people on twitter or whatever they're not going to read his book right <laughs> so they don't get an actor right uh, <laughs> so, and I'm part of that progressive crowd, and I say, whoa, these really do need an anchor, which is probably why he was sort of popular among uh, among many of our friends either way, right? Uh, which was sort of surprising. Uh, and uh, and let, let's try and make an alternative to that, one that would be more congruent with this, uh, with this metamodern philosophy that we've been talking about for years, right? Right. Uh, 
Yeah, but the question still remains, and I, I try to find the right framing because I, I get that you know we are all driven by our chemicals and our biases and have our natural tendency to be more like conservative or more progressive. But then at the same time, there's the question: Okay, we we are in a time of crisis, and we need some form of uh, meta models, let's say, or ways to have some distance to our own bias, right? So because like we we can't solve those problems alone, you know. It's like of course it would be nice if the you know it's like mm, you know the the actions of the last generation, you know, with the hands on the on the walls and with the tomato sauce on the Van Gogh pictures, and so I kind of I kind of sympathize with them because the the, po the politicians failed to solve those the, the climate problem for forty years now. And some somebody has to do so. what? What else can they do? So I kind of naturally have some form of sympathy, uh, sympathy. Although I understand the conservative viewpoint that okay, these are great, important uh, uh, portrait, um, you know, paintings and works of art. But you know, it's like you have to kind of harmonize all these kinds of different perspectives. And I think um, as a meta modern approach. Like how how biased can you be, mm -hmm. right? And how yeah. much distance do you have to, have to have uh, for your own for your own bias in a kind of way? Right, yeah. right. And so, so I mean, if, 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 first of all, I I think what you raise is a very important question, um, and, and I think the answer that people look for in these to, to this question tends to not zoom out enough right and and people tend to be a little bit they tend to want to do too much in one in, in one in one step right um so again sequentiality bigger picture dialectics um, um are important and if you if you let's just draw a very rough map so so it's it's cultural history is sort of a melody and it plays and like the, the the note that plays next is is harmonious with this with a, a formal one but it's what sort of melody is world history well it's 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 not twinkle little star it's some sort of um uh it's some sort of uh i don't know romantic uh second half of the 19th century <laughs> It's the stuff that would make it into a movie in the first half of the 20th century. It's that sort of music, right? Uh, so if, if, if we look at, we had a, a, a progressive wave that went through this irony and the 90s and everything, and this postmodern political correctness and wokeness. And, and it was a really, 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 really successful act changing the norm structures if not necessarily the developmental psychology of the population as we discussed earlier. Now we see on this sort of revolution, we, we're seeing towards this sort of revolution of the, of the mind of the norms, of the symbols of, of, of the games of everyday life, we are seeing a huge reaction, right? Uh, um, so, which I mean, is people sometimes call it fascist. There's a, some, but it's not exactly that. It's just like everyday folks, and particularly white men, particularly the countryside, particularly less educated, were really alienated by this takeover, right? And and they were you used to be the core of culture in uh, this particular group. Used to be the core group of of. Uh, culture in Western countries, particularly in nation states like Sweden, right? So they reacted and we got Trump and we got everything else, right? And in, in that reaction, more intellectual forms of it also, we have Jordan Peterson, right? Uh, who attacks uh, some, the, 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 the he, 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 for instance, wants particularly close down sociology departments and so forth. So let's, let's, let's get the students to, to stop applying to those and stuff like that. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and th this group is really determined to bring down what they see, see as some sort of attack on their institutions and, and so forth. People sometimes say, oh, it's a powerful group that now is, uh, feels threatened and that they get really cruel, but they don't feel powerful, right? They, they're, they're losing their jobs. They're, they're you know, uh, not, not having their real incomes uh, uh, 
increase uh, they're losing their wives too for that matter <laughs> i mean it's it, the group doesn't actually feel very very powerful <laughs> it mm. just looks like it if you walk through an airport and you look at who walks here most confidently and with the most money it's always going to be a white guy right so that, so from the outside the group looks really powerful uh if you just just have those goggles on but if you're a white guy yourself and you know all of the fates of the white guys around you and you know their doubts and their lives and everything is like nah nobody feels powerful in this world we all feel fairly powerless and the world is also right. bigger and bigger more chaotic than we can manage right and so so they're reacting because they felt that they felt unjustly attacked and uh, and and like the norms that were being set up were sometimes unfair and, and and traps right so you start you stop you, you start saying one word but then they catch you saying another word wrong right mm -hmm. and now it's uh, the norms have mutated so fast and, uh, and you you just said lgbtq and you forgot some letter and now you're the bad guy and now you're gonna lose your job stuff like that right um and of course people get really fed up with that so so then you have the reaction, right? And Jordan Peterson writes for this reaction. However, when he writes his rules, he believes that that the, the postmodern stuff and so forth really, uh, and, and all this wokeism, that, that is just that it's just a delusion of the mind, right? That it's, uh, or, or, or the senses, and it's that, that it is an existential uh, cop out uh, that uh, they hate God or stuff like that, right? Mm. And he, he just thinks they have to be defeated, right? All right. Um, and what happens is this polarizes furthermore, right? So, what a book like this can do, it can't do everything for everywhere, for everyone all at once, right? You cannot do that, but it can be a little bit everywhere all at once. It can counteract you can it can use that in my mind actually largely pathological uh, splinter that has grown now that people love peterson or they hate him or they even worship the guy right? and and they okay then then you get a nuanced little little crumbs to the peterson folks like hmm, maybe there was another you, you try this five years ago Okay, and your know, life sort of changed, right? Mm. You took a more serious thing. Maybe there is something more here, right? Maybe there is uh, like, what was that bigger purpose you wanted, right? Uh, maybe actually the the, the the social justice issues aren't such a bad source of of, of such purpose, right? Maybe right. maybe there and and from the other side, right? Uh, maybe uh, oh, you really hated Peterson, but actually maybe anchoring yourself in rules um, and uh, and so on isn't such a bad idea now i present them in a way that it's more cocky funny right so so it's going to speak more to this crowd um but but i mean you can't do everything but that's that that would be the idea that there's a certain overlap between all the people who like this self-help project and all the people who didn't but are more progressives and could have could have uh, benefited from from some uh, version of this sort of self help project, and those can be brought a little bit more uh, to, in, in in a similar direction, right? Um, and if you look at if you look at the structure of the book, you see there's the uh, unlike Peterson uh, stuff. There there is a um, a pot. I mean, stuff like environmental. Uh, activism and activism stuff and so on uh, are, are viewed in positive regard in my right. book. And there's an encouragement to do stuff like that. Um, and, but the book is still not about that. It's still in a way about cleaning your room. Uh, it's just about putting these two things in, in their proper dialectical or the right. proper dynamical process. Like, hmm, uh, why are you cleaning your room? Well, maybe because there is something you really care about, something bigger than yourself, right? Well, why are you, do you really care about something bigger than yourself? Well, on some level, it is actually because you want meaning and happiness in your life, because otherwise things would be too small and too petty, right? And 
And it tries to wriggle you out of certain pathologies that have to do with megalomania of wanting to save the world, right? So, so okay, maybe, like, what if, what if it's not about being a hero? Like, of course, nobody will admit that they want to be the hero, but we all sort of do. Uh, and, and then you need to actually, uh, you, then you need some, some space to actually look at, uh, or, or you, you, you need somewhere, some place, some safe space, like, a, like right, reading a book where you can reflect on how much you're in it for, for your own immortality project. And if there's a more healthy way that decenters yourself from it. So, so it's, yeah, I, I mean, there, there's no such thing as, as a perfect message that speaks to everyone, but I am concerned with those things with taking the next step, right? If you take this larger, larger zoomed out picture right. of, mm -hmm. aha, this, uh, this dynamic has happened. Then people are reacting like this. Okay. Then we, strike <laughs> strike again and we strike against the reaction we do right we strike against the petersonian life philosophy and it's conservatives but we try because to keep shouldn't the, you shouldn't you go for a synthesis and not for like an antithesis uh, no, well so, so so i think um th th that's that's the mistake everybody in our community makes right and which is why our community isn't very successful right uh because they they think that you can do everything at once right oh because synthesis means i'm a higher level thinker no it doesn't you have to uh, the synthesis is in the larger picture, in the larger uh, melody of, of history, you have, to view, you have to zoom out and you have to see, okay, what notes needs to be played? This one, boing. Um, and of course, you have to draw on whoever right. you are and what your personality is and right. so forth. Uh, but, but you can't always want to synthesize everything because uh, in the end, uh, you, I mean, first of all, not everything should be synthesized, right? If if somebody's taking a wrong direction and it's not leading it somewhere good, like, I mean, otherwise we always, let's say there's Hitler and there's Gandhi and we're like, okay, I can see why Hitler and Gandhi aren't actually, Gandhi did write a lot of letters to Hitler, but but never mind. <laughs> let's pretend oh, I, he get, did. I get what but, you're saying. But you, like, you can't just do in between and say like, let's let's yeah. do uh, let's do a synthesis, right? Mm. No, it's, it's, I get what you're saying, and um, uh -huh. you know, from from a social political point of view, I think you're certainly correct. I'm just coming from the point, and it's just a, it's an ongoing question that I haven't fully mm. reconciled or solved yet. So, uh -huh. is meta modernism left, right, or is it beyond that? Right. Yeah. And because I think it's still an ongoing conversation, what it is, because it has not yet fully unfolded yet. Yeah. Right. And so and so that I think that's the point where I'm coming from with this question. So so, so, as a, so as, sorry, as a writer, how much do you have to distance yourself from your own political bias? Yeah. But yeah. I don't I don't want you to answer that. It's just right. like something that I still struggle with, you know? Mm. So, 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 I mean, I, I, I think my, my, my answer is still, uh, I mean, we should, we should use who we are and express ourselves, right? But try to try, try to converge it with a bigger scheme of things, right? But right. it's, it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult issue, obviously. We'll see how this work plays out in the world. Uh, may, may, we'll see how, what, what I'm particularly curious about is like, how, how angry do people get, right? That's that's very interesting. It's a very interesting question. I mean, I don't want them to show up here and, and throw throw rocks through the, through the window. Uh, but 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 it, it would be easier necessary. ways for you to achieve that than to write a book, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they would, I guess. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I wanted to say something more on what you just said. Oh yeah, I mean, this is really outside the scope of the book, but the, the left writing. I do believe that metamodernism um, uh, needs a starting ground in, in the political sphere, and it has to be a little bit left-wing in terms of not necessarily uh, so much uh, uh, economic policy, but, but certainly in social policy. To a certain extent, it has to be. Uh, however, at the end of the day, uh, it is not, it cannot be defined in the, uh, like that, that's that's the entry point. Where 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 do we believe is the best portal to on on the normal spectrum, right? So some people are suggesting the far right, and they're they're wanting to use metamodernism 
for that with the picking up at a modernist uh, means in terms of uh, the aesthetics and so forth, right? And the last, last thing I heard about was a Finnish um, ethno-nationalist group who uses modernism in that regard. Wow, okay. But well, but first of all, they, they usually don't even get the basics of it, right? If you look at the, this intellectual and very, very, very thin. Um, but, but second of all, obviously that is not very inclusive of all the other perspectives. So, so that's pretty, pretty much on par with, with how Nazism sort of grew from, uh, you know, pseudo versions or, or, you know, a, bastardized versions of, of intellectual currents of their time but of right. course combined with very intelligent uh, people who had a strong agency of course so uh, uh but it was always theoretically thin right it was always theoretically thin uh nazism uh, and, and what, what we're seeing now is is the same thing like the the far-right folks there they're real curious about what how how should we frame ourselves so we look cool and somehow progressive and still nationalist and so forth. Uh, and, and they were looking to metamodernism, including its aesthetics. And, and uh, so I'm on far right reading lists, etc. Didn't exactly expect that. So, uh, but, but if you, uh, if you look what's more realistic, it's probably around, uh, I mean, not far left, but the center left on the libertarian side, uh, where, where you might find, uh, find a metamodernist uh metamodernist uh projects right politically however once you reach a certain level um of a, a establishment it has to be beyond the political spectrum and the ruse and the reason for this is uh, partly developmental um if you know about the developmental stages and you know about their distribution and you know about the correlation between uh, progressiveness, not left right wingness, but progressiveness and higher stage development. You will know that um, um, there there's a little bit more people uh, who are um, in, in terms of cognitive complexity um, at the abstract stage and, and a certain theory of cognitive complexity. Abstract stage is a fairly low one. Uh, then you have a central one that's called formal stage, or uh, it's, and then you have a, a higher complexity stage called systematic stage, right? But there are more people at the abstract stage than are at the systematic stage. So the whole thing is sort of skewed towards a bit lower complexity uh, than, than this uh, central, central issue, mm -hmm. formal, central stage formal, right? And uh, populists tend to work on left or right, but the, these days the populist uh, currents are clearly of the right for for a number of structural reasons. So the 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 the, the, the right populists who reach for lowest common denominators, they will speak to the lower complexity populations and higher complexity solutions that have to do with seeing whole systems or processes that reach better systems or higher truths or tractor points will will speak to a minority uh, so for this reason the 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 uh the right is going to win more and more uh, and it's not it's going to be bound with lowest common denominator ideas and policies and that is going to compound uh, the, the the transnational problems because they're trying to ignore the transnational realm of problems of migration and and, uh, and climate change uh, they for instance closed down the uh, the environmental uh, department the first thing they did here in sweden right so uh, they came to power just the other month right so so what what it's going to have to happen for progressive ideas to ever win is it can't just be on the left it's just gonna lose right it's going to have to take a, some sort of third position third position sounds like fascism but uh, but and uh, but it's going to have to meta play the game right it's going to have to work somehow across uh, the spectrum and play notes on the different spectrum to be truly transpartisan, truly work across the spectrum for, towards the higher, uh, the, the higher complexity solutions, right? And be more and more 
uh, rip itself loose uh, from from the question of interest groups, basically, right, and uh, and be driven more and more by the by the, the ideology of managing complexity or death, right, or bust, right, uh, which means managing perspective taking. So there are some there are some ground laying for that in this health help book. Actually, there are some ground laying moves for that, um, but of course, it's not a book on political theory nor on developmental psychology. So the book does not contain any such uh, such discussions, right? But but it, it's a, it's a book that at least lays the ground for that, right. Wonderful, Daniel. I think we got it. Let's close it at this. We did like nearly two hours. Oh, yeah, did yeah. We did a long time. Work. Um, thank you so much. I wish you all the best with the book. Um, 12 much, uh, much Better Rules for Life as a working title. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's the working title. Yeah, out in January. So, good luck uh, with that. Yeah. And, and good luck, Tom, with, with your book also. Uh, and. Yeah, well. um, And um, thank you so much for having this uh, conversation with me. I'm looking forward to see, seeing what happens out there in this strange world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wonderful.